Now we're going to focus on DNA replication. Before we get to that, I just want to give you the bigger picture, which is this three-step process that allows DNA molecules to, the, the code that's on our DNA molecules, to be translated into all of the proteins that our cells need to function. This is the process, this, this three-step process is the process that allows for our genetic information to be passed on from parents to offspring. And then for our genetic information or codes on our genetic information to be translated into the work that our cells need to do. So unfortunately, it is a very difficult, challenging process to understand. It is, um, it's probably the most difficult concept in General Bio 101. So I hope that you will, you know, I'll do my best to explain things here, but I hope that you will use other resources that you can find. Look at Khan Academy is probably a good source to help hear this a different way. Um, look at the videos and links that are provided in your textbook. And really, you, you may really have to dig deep into this information to get a good grasp on it. So three steps, replication, transcription, translation. So replication is DNA molecules making more DNA molecules. That's what we've been talking about with the cell cycle. When DNA replicates itself in order for the cell to be ready for division, that is DNA becoming more DNA, replication. The second one here is transcription. That is the genes, individual genes on our DNA molecules being transcribed into RNA molecules. So transcription is DNA to RNA. And then translation is taking that message that's on the RNA molecule and translating it into proteins. So replication is DNA to DNA, transcription is DNA to RNA, and translation is RNA to protein. So just to give you a brief overview, now we're going to focus on just this, the first step, DNA replication. So in order to understand how DNA molecules replicate, let me first show you how one aspect of the DNA molecule that we haven't talked about yet, and that is that each side of the DNA molecule, the double helix, is an inverse strand to the other. So you can notice here that this on the left side, it says five prime and then three prime at the top. So five prime at the bottom, three prime at the top. On the right side, you can see five prime at the top, three prime at the bottom. What that means is it's referring to, the three and the five prime there, is referring to specific carbon atoms in the sugar molecule, the deoxyribose sugar molecule. There are five carbons within that molecule. Those carbons are numbered one through five. So on the left side, number three carbon is sticking off the end. On the right side, the number five carbon is sticking off the end. So I'll show you that better a little bit later when I, we have a slide that, where you can actually see that a little bit. But just know that these are complementary strands is what we call it. They are in two different directions. So we call that complementary strands, five prime to three prime on one side, three prime to five prime on the other. And that becomes important when the, when the molecule replicates. So here's a very simplistic look at DNA replication. So we're starting off with the parent DNA molecule, that double strand, right, two sides to it. Then that molecule replicates itself, it copies itself. When it copies itself, we end up with two new molecules of DNA where half the molecule is made up of the old strand and half of it is a new strand. Same on this one, half is the old strand, the other half is a new strand. So the old strand is recycled into the two new strands. So we call this semi-conservative replication. This side of the molecule acts as a template for the new side on one of the molecules. This side of the molecule acts as a template for the new side of the other new molecule. 
Now there are a number of enzymes that are involved in DNA replication. The first one I'm going to talk about is helicase. So remember with enzymes, anytime you have ASE on the name is referring to an enzyme. The fact that this one is called helicase tells you it has something to do with the helix. So the helicase enzyme breaks the hydrogen bonds to open up the double strand, to open up the helix. So it breaks open the helix. So we have the original molecule up top here, and then helicase comes in and opens up this molecule. So now we've exposed the nitrogen bases on both sides so that this left side can act as a template and the right side can act as a template. And then you can see all of the new bases being brought in that match with the template strand. So everywhere that there's a cytosine will be a guanine. Wherever there's an adenine, there'll be a thymine. If there's a thymine, an adenine. If there's a guanine, a cytosine. So here are the growing new strands that are being added to the template strand from the old molecule. Once all of the, the entire molecule has been copied, then the two molecules will separate and the helix will rewind. Now here is a more detailed look at what's going on with the replication process and the enzymes involved. So you see helicase. So that's the enzyme that's unzipping or opening the helix. In the diagram here, helicase is shown as this blue triangle on the left. There's a blue triangle on the right. So they are, this is happening at multiple points throughout the whole DNA molecule. So many places the helix is being opened up and replication is occurring, occurring simultaneously so that it can happen very quickly. So we have these helicase enzymes opening and creating what's called the replication bubble. So opening the, the helix so that enzymes can have access to those bases and new bases can be brought in. So that's the first enzyme, helicase. The second one here is called DNA polymerase. So the DNA polymerase enzyme, again, ASC tells us it's an enzyme. DNA polymerase tells us that it is involved in building DNA molecules. In fact, it attaches the bases. It brings in the new nitrogen bases to attach to, to match them up with the complementary base pairs. And then DNA ligase, ASC tells us it's an enzyme. Ligase means that it is sealing up fragments that are, that are caused by the replication process. So I'll look at this in more detail here with you in just a moment. But what you can see by this diagram is that when the DNA molecule is replicating. The polymerase enzyme can only add new nitrogen bases to the three prime end of the growing molecule. So here we have three prime, five prime template there, and then the growing strand is here, the red growing strand there. With This is the polymerase that's bringing in the new nitrogen bases and adding those bases to the three prime end. So one side of the molecule creates what we call the leading strand. This is one long continuous strand where those nitrogen bases are being added on just one after the other. On the other side of the molecule, we have what we call the lagging strand. And what that means is because the polymerase can only operate, can only add onto the three prime M, it has to occur in chunks. So, replication is occurring like this, it's growing in this direction, I mean it's growing in this direction, but it's being added on this end, the three prime end of that new molecule. And so what ends up happening is we have multiple DNA polymerase enzymes and multiple fragments where the new strand is growing. Those fragments are called Okazaki fragments. And then that's where the DNA ligase comes in, because after replication has occurred, there are all these breaks in that fragment or in that strand. And so DNA ligase comes in and seals up these fragments to make it a continuous strand. So we have one continuous strand called the leading strand, and then we have one broken strand on the other side called the lagging strand. And DNA ligase is needed to seal up those fragments. So here you can see DNA polymerase in action. 
you can see that these are the nucleotides that are being brought in. Notice that there are three phosphate groups represented. If you remember, ATP molecule, ATP is also a nucle uh, nucleic acid that has three phosphates. But the nucleotides that are in DNA and RNA only have one phosphate. They have a sugar, a phosphate, and a base. These nucleosides, they're called when they have three phosphates, are brought in. You can see the guanine coming in to match up with the cytosine. They have three phosphates because remember with ATP with the three phosphates, it's a high energy molecule. The same idea is here that these phosphates actually give the nucleosides energy so that the polymerase enzyme can bring them in and then there's energy released when these phosphates are given up to form a bond. The phosphate then forms a bond with the sugar. The guanine then forms hydrogen bonds with the cytosine. Here's a second guanine coming in because there's another cytosine there. So the energy comes from these extra phosphates that are ultimately released, and then we end up with a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. So this is a growing strand. Oh, notice here as well, there's the three prime sugar. So that's the three prime end. That's the end where the nucleotides can be brought in and attached only on that three prime end of the molecule. And then this is showing ligase, how the ligase enzyme works. Again, where you have, this is the original parent DNA, each side acting as a template, and then the new strand of DNA being built here, one continuous leading strand. Again, it's only, the nucleotides can only be added to the three prime M. Here's the lagging strand where the new nucleotides are added to the three prime end, which causes these Okasaki fragments to form lagging strand, leading strand, and then here's the ligase coming in, the ligase enzyme that seals up those gaps. So to summarize here, if you're looking at the original parent molecule at the top, you can see where it's five prime to three prime, three prime to five prime, those are those complementary strands. And then uh, helicase is gonna come in and open up that molecule so that each side can act as a template for the new strand that is being formed. DNA polymerase is bringing in the nucleotides, the new nucleotides, and DNA ligase goes through and seals up any of the Okasaki fragments and any other fragments that might have resulted. Now, one interesting thing that results from a lagging strand is telomeres. And you may have heard telomeres as how they relate to our aging process. You may or may not have heard about that. But telomeres are these extra pieces at the end of our DNA molecules that get shorter and shorter as we age. And so we can look at the length of our telomeres to determine how much time has passed, how many replications essentially that DNA molecule has gone through, has undergone. And part of our symptoms of aging have to do with the fact that our telomeres are getting shorter and shorter. So there's quite a bit of research into anti-aging research into looking at how to keep our telomeres from getting shorter. Anyway, the way that this results is that because of the lagging strand problem, and then the ability for the enzymes to get in, the um, polymerase, DNA polymerase to get in, there are always a, a section of the DNA molecule that does not get replicated. Now these sections do not code for specific proteins and things that our cells need, they're sort of extra DNA, but whenever, we, whenever there's a section that doesn't get coded, then that piece is left off in the next the next time the DNA replicates. So, but there there is an enzyme called um, telomerase that is its job is to help finish off those sections of the telomere that did not get replicated. So, if that enzyme is present, then replication then that that strand of DNA that wasn't replicated can be completed. It can be replicated. However, most of our cells do not have telomerase. Most of our cells uh, don't have it at all, which means every time our cells divide, their 
those telomeres get shorter and shorter. If we could replicate the telomeres with telomerase, then the telomeres would stay long. And so the idea is, is there some type of gene therapy that would allow or that would put these enzymes in our cells to keep the telomeres from getting shorter? Now our cells are dividing all the time. DNA is replicating all the time. As we talked about with the cell cycle, we're always replacing cells depending on which cells we're talking about in the body, some more frequently than others, but we're constantly replacing cells. Our cells are constantly dividing, which means we are continually replicating our DNA. With this happening so frequently in so many cells throughout the body, mistakes happen. When mistakes happen, we call them mutations. And we talked about this again with the cell cycle, that there are points within the cell cycle that check for mistakes. We have proofreading that checks for mistakes and corrects them before the cell can divide so that those mistakes aren't passed on to the next generation or the next, the daughter cell. So we have proofreading mechanisms. You can see here that thymine and guanine were matched up. That isn't correct. This thymine should be a cytosine. And so that, that match, that base pair, needs to be corrected. So proofreading is ha happens, the mistakes can be corrected. And you can see that here, that's what this mismatch repair means. So we detect that there's a problem and then correct it right then and there. Some of these mutations are caused by chemical exposures, exposures to the sun, x-rays, those sorts of things can cause mutations, or they just happen spontaneously. So it's spontaneous mutations. Nothing really seems to cause them. It just happens sometimes. Now, some of these mutations are point mutations, as I was just describing with that one base pl being placed in, instead of the, uh, another one. So an incorrect base adding being added instead of the correct base pair. That would be a point mutation. And sometimes these are silent. So the top one here is talking about silent mutations. And this I'll have to get into a little bit more detail later when we're talking about the next step of transcription translation. And that is that even if there is, you can look here, every three bases, and again, we'll talk about this more in a bit, every three bases equals a specific amino acid. These are all amino acids, and they string together to make the protein, which is our ultimate goal here. So every three bases equals one amino acid. So we have these three bases, serine. These three bases, valine. These three bases, these three bases. So what you can see here, this is a point mutation. Right here is adenine, supposed to be adenine. Thymine gets placed in accidentally. But because of how our codes work, codes for amino acids work, not every point mutation creates an incorrect amino acid. So GTA, guanine, thymine, adenine, brings in a valine. Guanine, thymine, thymine also codes for valine. So this gives us a little bit of a buffer to make mistakes, that not every mistake will cause a problem in the, in the ultimate protein that's being made. So that would be a silent point mutation. Mutation happened, mistake happened, but the result was not noticed. Missense mutation, point mutation here. Again, it's a point mutation. You can see here CCC, right here, adenine was placed instead of cytosine. So we ended up with ACC. ACC gives us a different amino acid than CCC. If we substitute a different amino acid, we are going to completely change the protein that is being formed. So this is a mutation, still a point mutation, but it actually does have or could have devastating impacts. Nonsense point mutation, same idea again, is that we have a point mutation. In this case, it's here, TAC was replicated to be TAG. So point mutation, G instead of C. But in this case, 
TAG is a stop codon. It stops the replication process. It stops the, the transcription process. So that it completely stops what the building of the protein, which means you have a shortened protein, which is not going to be the same protein as was initially intended. So these are three different results of a point mutation. Now, frame shift mutations result because a piece of the DNA has either been snipped out or a new piece has been accidentally placed in, or sometimes they are flipped or a, piece, a chunk of DNA is, is reversed, it's flipped around. All of these things about frame shift mutations we will look at when we get to genetics because frequently they end up causing significant genetic disorders. So what we're looking at here, you have A, G, C, G, T, A. A, G, C, and then you see the G, but the T, A is gone. And so that C, C, C is broad in line from right here. So we lost those two bases. When that happens, it shifts the entire reading sequence. So serine is still the first amino acid there. Valine, it just so happens, is still there, okay. But then now from that point forward, we have different amino acids being added because when it's reading the codes, the genetic codes, it reads them in groups of three. So we have shifted the reading of those codes, which will completely change the resulting protein. Okay, we'll get more, get to that more later when we're talking about genetics. Let's take a break now, and with the next video, I will pick up with how we make the proteins.